Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is uh, Wednesday, and it's our investment show. My name is Sasha Starr, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, my guests. On the panel is uh, Nick Paliveda, uh, who is the founder of this uh, network, and also Peter Bennett, who is our regular on investment show. Hello, Peter. Hi, Stephen. How are you today? Oh, good, good. Well, the market is doing fine, and uh, I would like to talk. <laughs> thank you. I would like to talk about um, one interesting. Okay, uh, I'd like to talk about one interesting um, point about acquisition of stocks. The process that we're going through. Just recently, I know that at least two of us, me and myself, but maybe Peter did too, acquired uh, some positions in the stock by his name FireEye, and um, that looks like um, interesting uh, situation. I would like to ask Nick, uh, how? Uh, how did you actually execute the trade? Okay, you made up yeah. your mind that this is in the right industry, it's the right stock. Right. So how then you proceeded? Well, uh, I think it's the same analysis I did with um, the other one I bought. The problem is when I look at these things, sometimes ago I was a little too wimpy uh, in terms of how much I bought. Okay, and so when I bought XL Brands, I put some money into it. It's already up. I only bought it like a month ago. It's already up 28.53%. But I brought XL Brands based on what I saw Halston um, on That's Netflix. Right. I don't know if you saw that movie, but it's a killer movie. Absolutely. Free ad for them. They're not a big company. So um, having that type of advertisement for a year, I figured, well, I'm going to hold it for at least a year and see how it goes because I think they're going to have a positive effect. So it's more, uh, more analytical, more fundamental mentals what business you're in and how you're positioning yourself than it was looking at all the details of the financials okay um because you, you know you can spend hours with these stupid things you, you know that oh, no, no, and, and you still and you oh, still yeah. might be wrong you still might be wrong okay Absolutely. and so the thing is and part of it is you don't never get the right information i i have a story with mutual benefit life when i was involved with them back in the 90s i was number three producer of, in the country, I built up eight hundred thousand dollars in renewals, and they assured me the company has been around for one hundred and twenty-five years. I checked; it did. They assured me it had three billion in cash. Check; it did. The president, the vice president, which was Hank, Kate, Steve, Carlotti, both say we're in great position. And I went back to work uh, Monday when I was in Greenwich. Actually, I had my house in Greenwich at the time. My wife's in a house in Boca. I had two other houses. Yeah. And a bunch of cars and kids in private schools. I got a notice in the Wall in the Wall Street Journal in New York Times, mutual benefit to go out of business Monday. I'm going like, what? You know, you just lost eight hundred grand just like that. Okay, because uh, I lost all my renewals, I lost everything. I was going like, what? I had a million in insurance applications sitting there, and you're out of business now. Why? What they didn't disclose. Was the th was a three billion dollar callable note with the New Jersey Hospital Authority? If they lost ratings from double A plus to double A or some stupid thing like that, and because of that, the New Jersey called the note and you lost everything. And I'm going like I was number three in the country company and I didn't know about it. I mean, so the real problem with getting all the little knowledge and other people that find toothpick everything sasha is you still don't you still may not get it you still may not know and then you get a big unfortunately i had almost all my eggs in that one basket the basket dropped and everything you know little uh, footnote nick 
But so at the time, because I was I knew about this, and um, <laughs> so S and P Moody's and I believe Fitch. I don't want to swear to that. Sure. All rated the company. I believe AAA. Yeah, they did. Double A. They, they had right. phenomenal right. ratings. By the way, right. just giving credit, there was one company I knew of called Weiss. And yes, Weiss I remember was, Weiss, right. And Weiss was giving it a D plus. Right, Weiss was right. And right. yeah, Weiss, Weiss was right. But but if you looked at Moody's, Standard and Poor's, you'd go, this is a safe company. The odds yeah. of, if you look up like those kind of ratings, you, the odds are like, it's not going in bankrupt in a hundred years. So yeah, no, so you're no, right. right. I mean, well, I it's mean, so I mean, hard to get information. I, I, uh, th that part of the information, but remember, I was in sales, so they there was no obligation, and I had a policy with it, but there's no real obligation on their part to disclose that to me. No. We did ask for all the information, and come on, look, look, if you have a company that's worth $10 billion and they show you have $3 billion in cash, you figure they're going to be sound, okay? So the real problem with all these people that, Investing, you know, and, and uh, you you never know. In other words, there's some uh, black swan yeah, out there. Yeah. Okay. No, there so are, so there. now now you go to FireEye. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is get involved in the cyber uh, security industry. Oh. Okay. In other words, I want to take a position in cybersecurity. Why? Because of what happened to the Colonial Pipeline. I believe it's going to repeat itself. That was the main driver. Is I had no exposure. Remember, if I was diversified, I didn't have everything with mutual benefit. I'd have been really, really okay today. But unfortunately, you weren't allowed really to do that. You had to put all your business with that one company. So, you know, and so I'm not going to put everything with FireEye. But I was looking around for a cybersecurity stock to invest in. The number one driver was the 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 sector that they were in, and the bet is that this is going to repeat itself. And of course, it did. And now the question is, and there's still a lot of unanswered questions with FireEye, that's the reason I'd like to bring it before this panel, is um, who's going to be the winner of that game? In other words, uh, well, who's going to be the winner? Peter, I don't know. You know, Who's going to win the cybersecurity? Who's going to be the dominant player in that industry? You know, Because there's, there's always a dominant player. I bet on Pfizer a long time ago. And I'm done real well with Pfizer. I'm sticking with the because I believe they were going to be the number one. They had already, to me, won the game, and they're going to be the number one player. It's like, it's like Sasha betting on Magnus Carlson against Ian Napolacali. Okay, I don't know what the odds are, but it's got to be heavy in favor of Magnus Carlson. He's going to crush that guy. Okay, oh, so I bet on Pfizer because Pfizer is the dominant player, and I'm not sure FireEye is going to be the dominant player. Two, three, or they're going to wash out. But I think they're a player. That's it. Okay. Um, speaking about Magnus Carlsen, a while ago, one of the uh, tournaments that he organized, the betting side, Bet365, offered odds on yeah, the, odds of the tournament. The odds on Carlsen before tournament started was 1.66. Can you imagine? So you can put actually uh, $750, which I did, and yeah, clean yeah. up uh, $1,250. Really? Uh, yeah. on, on Magnus, on Magnus. Absolutely. I, I, it's incredible because he's like uh, very seldom that he doesn't win a tournament. Uh, very seldom. Why were the odds then? I mean, look, those bookies, just like any football event, bas basketball betting event, they know where the money's coming in. Sure. So somebody must have thought there was something going on, you know. Usually, because I wouldn't compare uh, the depth of the market on a soccer match or a basketball and the chess. I think there are far fewer bids on chess. Oh, okay. Bets, yeah. And I think the margin of error is way much higher for bookies to offer any odds. And I think, <laughs> I think they paid a lot of money out because they don't offer odds on chess anymore. There you go. You have to add a betting element to your chess show. <laughs> well, 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 yeah. There, I mean, the thing is, really, in what you're doing when you're looking at stocks, you're just putting bets on companies. The, and yeah. the thing is, a long time. By the way, all my companies are up since we started this. Okay. that's. Every, I, I, I think it, it applies the same to me and to Peter because if, if the market is up, uh, the, I have the only stock that is down is the TZA, which is my protection for the huge 
uh, really large downside in the market, yeah, yeah. which will come. Nobody knows when, but it will come for sure, sure sooner or later. However, I, I uh, still uh, able to sell covered calls against this position, so I'm taking a little bit of money here in, you know, here and there. But Nick, my my actually question was different. Yeah, I, yeah. I I I I didn't ask you why you selected that stock. That's obvious. What I was interested in the mechanics of actually executing the trade. Oh, that, that's that's really how sad. how do you do that? I have an account on TD Ameritrade, and so right. I, just, I, I just buy it off TD Ameritrade. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you, you know, there, there are ways that you can play those little tiny things. I just buy I buy it at market. I don't really give a rat's rear because I'm not looking to uh, make money in a, a day trade or week trade. Uh, my, my, I say I have, a, I have horizons for all these, uh, and at a certain point in time, it's going to be time. Like my horizon for Hertz, I dumped it when it went straight up to six a share. I didn't okay, believe well, it. I did not easy. believe. I don't know if it was a good move or a bad move, but I didn't believe in what I did to begin with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so the thing is, when you get a big win, I go, "This is ridiculous," because they still have a lot of problems. I dot, dropped Carnival. Because Carnival Cruise Line, I still think they have a lot of problem. It had an uptick, took the uptick. No, I wouldn't touch Carnival. Yeah. Well, thank, thank mean, you. Well, you did now. well with it. But, I did well with it. And but Walgreens, I keep reading things about their huge debt. And, the, and, and you're the, right. Yeah, I'm saying. They, they have, but the airlines is another thing. I still. I, yeah, I know I, you're still in Delta. Uh, oh, I love a, Delta. My friend who's a technical man. analyst yeah. says it's going to 60 by September, and he's usually right. Yeah, and, and Walgreens Boots Alliance, when you're right, was the big win a long time ago. But my theory was. Right. The pandemic will bring people into those places, and that stock them up like uh, my big one was Hertz, by the way. But are this you one, out of WB or A? No, or I'm still in there. It's thirty eight. It's up thirty eight point six seven. But here's the reason why I was going to reevaluate now. But the reason why I'm not out of WBA is because I still think they have some more potential. In other words, they're not. They, they haven't really peaked yet, so I'm still holding it. And I do uh, have a to, tendency to get out early, but if you got me some reasons to get out of our Oh, I'll give you a reason right out. now. Although, yeah, you know, out. first of all, just to go back to that point, because it applies here too, nobody, there is no almost risk-free return. One no. of the biggest things you learn in MBA school over and over again is there's a line of risk and reward. And as you get a higher payout, or, you know, higher potential reward, you take more risk. If you want no risk these days, you have to put it in a savings account at one percent or less. Oh, oh one yeah. would be. You tell me where to get a savings account at one. I'm getting 0.4 percent on American there Express yeah. right now. Right. There you go. And yeah. um, or you, or you can go with a 10-year Treasury at 1.5, or you can get a. Now the 30-year is 2.1 or somewhere around there. And so they're almost paying no interest, which forces people to go into the stocks. But back to WBA, and again, yeah. who knows? I mean, it's just, all I know is this is why I didn't buy CVS. And I kept looking at CVS because I have a, you know, I'm like maybe 8% cash now and it's, I'm having trouble again. You know, I, I like to spread things out, you know, you know, could always buy a bond at 1%, you know, but it's not gonna do much for me. But so here's the thing, I use CVS a lot. And so I, the new deal is they give you $10 if you subscribe to their, to a kind of like service they give you. So you pay $5, they give you $10 in coupons. Then when you go into the store, they give you things like $10 free money. And, right. and they also give you like 40% off. So the last two or three months, I've been going in the store and I'll tell you where I'm going on this, but I've been going in the store and I get like $30 worth of stuff for like $7, you right. know, $30, sometimes five, $20 for $5, you know? And the reason I think they're doing this is pressure from Amazon and online sales, because I think that they wouldn't be doing it otherwise, because I don't think if they're making a even break even on these deals, it surprised me. But the, the amount of merchandise I'm getting between the $10 starting free money, you know, for $5 and then the coupons that I'm getting back and the percentages, it's amazing. But, you know, but if you go on Amazon, you get super cheap prices. So so it makes me nervous, WBA, over the long run, um, although I have a mutual fund, RHS, which I probably still owns it. And but it's one of like 33 holdings. And I like it because it's all consumer staples. So that that I don't mind. But but 
I, yeah. I'm uh, nervous about WBA. Yeah, yeah well, uh, thing about WBA is very simple. The company is going through a lot of improvements now. They have a huge cash flow and cash position is very good. But the most important thing that all that will result in a takeover bid, I think the a takeover of funds, cash funds, that they are looking for takeover, they are looking for cash. And that company represents a cash flow as very few companies really uh, can come, be compared to that. So I think that one day there will be a takeover. By, by who? By what kind of company? By who? Yeah, that's the question. All kinds of uh, investment. Oh, I think Amazon will probably buy them. Not even Amazon. <laughs> probably uh, not. I think <laughs> it's a distribution center. center. Uh, I think all this. Yeah, it could be. It could be. <laughs> They're I buying think, everything. Uh, Did you see they acquired MGM last week? Yeah. Uh, MGM Studios. That's a uh, huge acquisition for them, uh, but it shows that their their play in media is serious. Actually, it's very small for them. <laughs> it's yeah, very big right. for any other company. Big for the, any other it, company, right? It's a tiny little bit for them. It's like yeah, right. one thousandth of their I know. <laughs> yeah, but still, you know, yeah, cash flow or something like you know revenue. Um, um, I, I would like also remind you, that the but they're they're serious about Amazon Prime because Netflix is. And and these other you know streaming is part of the future, obviously just part because I think broadcast TV is going to do well too. But um, yeah. but so they're trying to get more into that business. So so I was looking cash flow on WBA, you know, and I'm going to see what that is. But um, the so yeah, the cash flow is good right now, eight times cash flow. So. Yeah, uh, that that's actually like getting twelve percent. It's price uh, over. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious as how much real estate they own because uh, how much they own yeah. and how much they lease. That would be my interesting part uh, because real estate values are going up, and I think in inflation they're going to continue to go up. If they own all their real estate, I'm going to stay with WBA. If they're leasing, because remember oh, that's, that's been a then then my I'm, I may dump it because the thing is, remember Blockbuster Video when they went under. The real problem they had in the stores that were around were ones that owned their own buildings, and there weren't that many of them. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, have, okay. I don't know. You know, yeah. look at the cash flow, I'd say maybe there is a chance WBA does well in the long well, run. Well, they, if they own their real estate, right. fine. If they right. release, I'm... Well, I'm real estate is an going. interesting thing. I have a really interesting point. I'll use this as a bridge into it because it relates to real estate in the United States and commercial real estate and office. Because I saw a few interesting things. I've had, I've been saying for months now that I thought there was going to be a black swan very potentially in the United States in a collapse of the office market. And I've seen three three things I'm going to highlight quickly um, why I think that could even be more true now. But nobody is talking about it almost. I've only heard one person say it and they say, ah, no problem. But they don't talk about it on TV. They don't talk about it on anybody. But I see it developing. And it reminds me of the big short because this guy like shorted the uh, mortgage market for four years and then nobody believed him and all of a sudden it happened. But, but that's it. I'm not playing it. But I'm just I'm avoiding anything to do with that offices and banks, too. Yeah. So, so listen to this. First of all, keep in mind, banks are 90 percent leveraged on, av on, on right, average. They're heavily so, leveraged, right. Yeah, they're heavily leveraged. So they only have 10 percent to spare. You know, if there's a real a disaster, you know, a black swan. So yeah. listen to this. First of all, in the U.S., since 2018, uh, occupancy is down 32 percent right now. Um, and if you go city by city, some are shocking. New York City is 33 percent. Um, uh, Washington DC is down 42%, but they've also only come back relatively small to get to this 32. In other words, it went down even more, but it's only back up 22%. Right. So right now the office market is 17% vacancies, which is a, a record. I believe it's a, a record permanently and sublease space more than doubled last year because a lot of these companies are saying, OK, we're going to put our employees, give them a choice like Microsoft said to this to 50,000 employees. We're going to give you a choice to uh, work at home. So then the companies and Chase is mm -hmm. downsizing and a lot of other companies um, over and over salesforce.com. Um, so they're saying, you know, if you want to work at home or you come in once a week or whatever, you need a lot less space. But here's the amazing thing that, you know, so you say, wait a minute, vacancy is at a all-time high. But listen to this. This I saw this week. This is the 
uh, you will not believe these numbers, the actual occupancy of buildings. Now, we're not talking about vacant um, space. We're talking about who's showing up at office buildings. So Dallas, the occupancy rate in Dallas is 42%. So no, wait, this is just, I'm just giving the teaser. Yeah. So, so 42%, Los Angeles, 25%. 75% of the employees are not coming to work. It means the buildings are empty. Yeah, they're empty. And what do you do with empty buildings? You put them up to sublease. You say, oh, we, we don't need as much. Now, some of these, but here's the kicker before I tell you what it means, but New York City Metro, 17% occupants. 17%. And if you go to downtown, oh. and, it's, and it's supposedly worse in downtown, by the way, they say if go like downtown is a ghost town, basically. Yeah. So you have people going in once a week and people not showing up at the office because companies are doing. So nobody's assuming, even with these huge vacancies, you just go, isn't it quite possible that maybe the office, you know, vacancy rate will permanently be at 50 percent or 60, 70. But even if it's 20 or 30, there's going to be tons of vacancies everywhere. It's going to put a, and there already is and nobody's going to fill them. So this means to me, first of all, avoid commercial office buildings. Now, Dwayne Reed has storefront, you know, but maybe a lot of people can convert that too. You say, oh, I have an office building, but I'm going to add some storefront, you know. But so that could affect maybe WBC. I mean, um, but um, also, I'm avoiding banks, financials. I'm, I am too. Insurance companies have tons of commercial real estate. I don't like that sector. I work They're leveraged to a point. Yeah. Well, right. Otherwise, I like insurance companies. You know, maybe, although I've never really. They, 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 we 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 meet with them every week. They are squeezed, Peter, because of the low interest rate. Right, right. they can't make any money, and they can't they, make any money. Right, right. not not compared, and there's no safe money. You can't buy a ten percent right. bond now. Right. So also even and medical office buildings, because I'm thinking, wait a minute. Med although I have MPW because it's only hospitals, critical care hospitals, but there's a bunch that have hospitals and and office space. But I'm going, wait a minute. If I am a developer and owner of real estate and I can't get anybody in my office building, I can put a sign up and say, oh, medical office building, right? It's like, it's not that hard. Yeah. But, but So these companies are going to have to convert to residential possibly. That's what I, I think you're right. What you just said. And that's going to help like, the residential market, by the way. Right. Maybe, maybe hurt vac that may give more vacancies and like right. New York lens will go down for sure because yeah. all of a sudden people will be able to afford a one bedroom in New York. Yeah. But, and this is worldwide, by the way. But so, so all these sectors that are touched by commercial real estate, this could be the big black swan coming in the next few years. And that's going to keep interest rates down, which I already think they're going down to zero in the next eight years. But that'll just guarantee it because it'll be the next disaster to stimulate well, but, the economy. I, I think you're spot on. And, and I also think you're going to see a lot of conversions from office oh, to, yeah. to residential because like in our hood, there is no townhouses available. I mean, we have 450 townhomes can't buy one they're, they're, they're all sold out is and, there a lot of office space in your area um i i don't know because i don't uh mess you don't around see with office space but but there, there are companies yeah. that are moving in that are taking office space but at the same time there are a lot of companies that are letting people work out of their houses now right. that's doing what exactly the saying diminishing the need for commercial but also people tend to buy bigger homes because they work out of their houses right. so they have, have like i do i got my you know, a room developed, you know, you have your room developed uh, uh, so you can live there and work there so you don't have to go to some crazy office. Right. Uh, so you're seeing that phenom take place. I don't see where that's going to change. All they're going to have yeah. to do is reposition from commercial to residential, but that costs money and time to do. It's oh, not yeah. like not like the easiest thing. No, these companies, the you know, they have a lot of debt, you know, it, whatever the ratio is, 50 percent, 80 percent debt. Yeah, they shouldn't have 80, but let's say it's 55 percent debt. And all of a sudden, right. now, hey, wait a minute, we have to put kitchens in for thirty thousand no, dollars. No, you're right. We have kitchens, to knock down. We have to redo I mean, the hall. We have to do, you know, everything. Not easy. Not yeah, you're, you're turning, turning. You just have basically a warehouse and now you have to put a lot of money into converting that. And what's yeah. happening in the meantime with the cash flows is like, Wait a minute, we're all vacant and we have debt. You know, right, so right. so I, I'm not touching commercial real estate, banks. Yeah. Again, but, who but knows let's, if let's see, anything Walgreens, will happen, but this could easily blow up. See, but Walgreens Boots Alliance isn't really a um, I know. commercial office space. It, it's there for people to go out and buy 
drugs and uh, you know no i know it's storefront level and everything so, and, so that's and they the have a lot of standalone stores so yeah. no it may be great you know what it's not bad compared to a lot of stuff out there with a huge danger yeah you know it's it's not bad but what i've, I've done well in is actually the oil and gas sector which uh i got yeah. into when it was low and now both exxon and bp are you know they're doing quite well and of course you have your my checking account mplx and um yeah What's the other crazy one? USA Compression Park. USAC. Yeah, right. USAC. Those are what I call, those are your, basically your money market accounts that pay very well because I don't see any, although I've had upside here, I didn't anticipate. And gold's been doing good too. But here's, here's going to be the real kicker in the economy. Is Biden going to print six trillion dollars no because they won't let them <laughs> not that much well, because, uh, well, well i mean the mansion and cinema and a few democrats i mean they're negotiating they wouldn't even negotiate with republicans probably do, if do they people didn't know how do people have any idea how big six trillion dollars is the number one economy u.s is in the 20 trillions china's in 15 third place is japan at four okay and we're printing more money than Japan, the whole country has. I mean, and when I say it's printed, because that's basically what they're doing, Peter. I mean, uh, yeah. it's back. Well, by, to me, it's that. like I don't even pay attention to it for two reasons. One, I don't think Biden's going to get anywhere near what he was asking, you know, because if, as I said, if he's negotiating with the Republicans, it means they can't push it through because they pushed a lot of things through without any bipartisan at all. It's like, okay, we've got the votes. That's it. Goodbye. You know, but, but there are a few people who are basically hopefully really saving the country on certain issues but joe manchin and cinnamon you know so all they, they need to lose one vote democrats say i'm not going to spend six trillion dollars and so then it's like negotiating so it'll probably come at a one and a quarter billion you know uh tr trillion or whatever in the end but it's all of pennies compared to the 200 trillion or 250 trillion of unfunded liabilities i talk about this all the time but that just the united states have and every other country in the world that i've ever looked at and i've looked at a lot has similar liabilities for medical care for their populations that they promise more or less free and they're not funded at all and nobody's even talking about it so what's six trillion out of 250 it's like and that's I, I, just, I, 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 you know i don't know you it's know just but, sooner uh, or later basically but, this but, is why interest rates go to zero because the governments are going to have to print money and they're not going to want to pay interest rates off yeah interest I, I, I agree and the and the the other other problem of course is what you just said the unfunded liabilities of medicare and social security oh yeah it's it's almost like being ignored and every time i analyze this because you know medicare tax is 1.45 matched by the employer 2.9 percent 2.9 percent does not cover no. your medical expenses no, i mean nowhere <laughs> near just okay. to give you an idea, since I'm in health insurance part time, um, I used to be full time, but now I you know, do other things and also. Um, uh, but anyway, so if you took a 64 year old and you have a 7,000 deductible, the premium for that person might, with a 7,000 upfront deductible for everything but preventive care, you right. might be looking at 1100 no, 1200 $1,300 a month, let's say. Right. Now that's, and as you get older, First of all, it's going to go way up from there. But second of all, the government, the federal government is basically giving me Medicare because I just went on, I'm going on Medicare this month. And um, you know what, for uh, let's say the average person, whatever, it depends on your income because it's income based, but I'm going to pay a little more this year, next year, whatever, but I'll get it down to probably where I can pay $300 a month for a zero deductible. Yeah. That's, and people are living longer. And, no, no, no problem. Uh, and yeah, because I mean, everybody knows, that, or a lot of people know this, but when Social Security and all these retirement systems were created, people lived to either 65 or some people say three years over 65. Now people are living the average people, you know, life expectancies are 85 and they could easily be going to 95 or 100. Or 100. Yeah. The, yeah. The With a, cure, a couple of cures, boom. And the government's on the hook for all this money. Nobody's worrying about it. They've been talking about it for 40 years. And so. They're going to print money, but they're not going to want to pay interest on it because that will just double it again. So a lot of money's coming out, which is why now I'm holding like four to five percent in gold and silver. You know, counting puts and everything. I bought a little. I sold a few silver puts at fifty four, and a, a little gold puts too, just to increase it. Night three percent gold, uh, because 
it's just insurance. I don't care if it goes up or down, but I'm just right. afraid the other 95% could go kablooey if, if they lose control. But the governments of the world are not going to want to lose control. They are yeah. going to do everything they could. And I would add one more thing. The way they control it is yield curve control. And this was done and for 11 years in World War II. The U.S. government did this. They said any interest over 2.5% on a bond, we're going to buy it. And so they just re they're funding themselves. Sure. And, the, and Japan did in 2016, brought their rates down to zero, and it never came off it. So, and they're doing it now it's in form because the government's buying one third of mortgages already right now, and they're buying tons of bonds. So they just increase the bonds. They it's sort of a Ponzi scheme in a way because they're buying from themselves. So in in the but in the end, it puts money out, but it goes to medical care. So. That that'll probably be medical inflation, but you know, but uh, they're on the hook for a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, and that, that, that's that's become a, a real problem. That's a long-term systemic problem that people in Washington D.C. do not want to address. Yeah, but it's not that long. It's you know, know the, they, they, the thing is, Peter, they don't have an answer to it. No, they can't. They, they've never had an answer to healthcare costs. No, that's because they promised the world to everybody, and nobody wanted to say you can't have it, and then they expanded it. You know, yeah. um, so it's like we don't want to tell you the truth. The truth is, we don't have the money, but right. but it is a problem because the non-discretionary part of the budget keeps getting bigger and bigger already. So I think the non-discretionary part of the budget is in the U.S. is about 85 percent already. Yeah. So it's like there's nothing to cut anymore, <laughs> and and you can't t tax that out of the economy because you'll destroy the economy. You know this. It, they think that some people say, "Oh, let's tax the rich." The rich are really rich, but there's not that oh, many of them, but, but, and the but, amount but, of money but, they but, have isn't that much. You see his his proposal when it comes to taxing the rich and stuff like that. They want to impose. Love this. I mean, it's going to destroy my whole strategy, Peter. What's They're going that? to propose a capital gains tax of like 48%. Oh, That's yeah. Only for if you're making over $400,000 is what they're proposing. <laughs> yeah. But that'll come down over time. Oh, uh, yeah, because 48% but, but CD tax. It won't collect as much as they think because a lot of people say, okay, I'll just manage my money. So, you know, the people who are making that right. kind of money will manage their money to, to try to keep it under the limits. But um, yeah. by the way, footnote. Of interest, I saw something on uh, just a day, couple of days ago. Um, there, there is in there an MLP, a change in MLP, Master Limited Partnership Tax Law. That initially I was very concerned, and I thought I'd make major moves, and I'll explain what it is. But now I made minor moves. But what the tax, what they said is in twenty, and this is just proposed. So first of all, you don't know what's going to happen, but. In there, and it only raises like a billion dollars, but and they're hitting a lot of smaller investors. But that doesn't say they won't do it because they very well may. So the MLP proposal is in 2026. So first of all, I'm not too worried because if I'm getting 10 or 12 percent or whatever on my funds, then um, you know I'll get half the money back or more by then. And there's a lot of ways they can adjust. But in 2026, the proposal is that the MLPs have to convert to basically corporations. So they'll lose some of their tax deferrals. They'll have to pay tax. But that said, they still get depreciation. They'll be able to store. I've seen this before where they'll be able to store up a lot of depreciation and they won't use it. And take, then they'll carry for a few more years. So that said, I, M MPLX I held totally. USAC I basically held totally. Right. This, this guy keeps writing articles that they may cut the dividend, but I even if they cut the dividend from oh, 13 because wow. it's narrow, yeah, it's 14 percent of 13 yeah. and a half. And if they cut it, it'll be the 10. They're very they they don't try to. They're a very reputable company. And so if they did cut it to 10, which I don't think they will, then so what? Because I think the company will be wow. around in 20 years. Um, right. But I reduced EPD down to a quarter percent, and I sold Sunoco, which was. Uh, uh, that I thought they were more leveraged and is more risky, and I've done very well with them. They were in an IRA. The little ones I hold in an IRA to avoid MLP taxes. As long as you don't have more than a thousand dollars of what's called UBTI, you don't get any penalties there. And um, well, then I also bought a little AM, which is a corporation already, and that one I really struggle on. Antero Midstream. I used to own it. It's been up and down. It's a pipeline out of Appalachia. They've it's funny because I think it's worth 
a lot, but every, all the analysts, Goldman, everybody says oh, it's worth eight, nine, it's already at over 10, but it pays nine and a half percent dividend. It's covering it. I cannot find any arguments against it. So I really struggled with that. So I went with like- what, what's, what's the name of the AM stock? Antero Midstream. Yeah, I mean, they've got good cash flow. There was concern about their parent years ago, in the last, last year or two, of, which is Antero Resources, sure. because they were losing money and they were afraid, oh, they're going to cut back and everything. But natural gas is certainly going to be around for till 2050. Right, right. I mean, not. yeah, yeah. I know. It's, it's, it's the fuel of the future. If you go to the sure. Energy Administ Information Administration, the EIA, you can look at their projections. These are U.S. government projections. And, that, and that's just in the U.S. The world isn't even going to convert to solar as fast as the U.S. So yeah. natural gas natural gas liquids is in huge demand or you know for other countries because they want to get rid of coal and oil first so right. so it seems really good but it makes me really nervous that all the analysts are saying eight and nine and i'm buying in a 10 and going what do they know that i don't know but i can't figure any argument so i bought a little bit of it yeah and uh, you know for me i like the pipelines in the energy sector oh, mainly yeah. Peter, once they set up the infrastructure, it doesn't. Re there's not a lot of innovation or com competitors yeah. that come in. Or, in other words, if they set it up to begin they're with, they're takers. A, yeah, as you're told, they set up as a dividend play. Then yep. it's, it's consistent cash flow. It's a dividend play. So, so I like that as a place to park as anchors. That's the reason I like MPLX uh, and uh, USAC because they're anchors and whatever the heck you're doing. Um, and, and Exxon and BP are, are pretty well managed. I was a little disturbed when yeah. the board, uh, they, they brought on these activist board members because they brought in what I call the crazies. And here's the problem I have with the crazies. Okay, Exxon Mobil is usually a very well managed company. They understand how to manage a company. The crazies aren't interested in managing a company. But there's only two of them on the board. So I know that. Really so apparently, apparently, but I was I was concerned that the stock would take a hit because they started to bring crazies on, as opposed to managers, which are are totally different. Yeah, business, part of the people, basically. business people. And part yeah. of the reason part of the reason you buy a stock, you buy it for the business people that are managing the company. One of my clients was a, a long time ago was a vice president of Exxon Mobil, pretty high up in New York City. And he, he, he went over how they were just basically a very well managed company, you know, and, and that's what I like about the oil and gas and energy sector. Most of them are very well managed companies. The problem I have with the tech sector, it's the wild, wild west. Somebody can do really well, and then all of a sudden they can do poorly. And you saw what just happened with Elon Musk. The SEC is coming down on his tail. Question is how how long is he going to be able to keep the SEC away from Elon Musk? And and if he goes, where does Tesla go? Tesla's already unstable. He's unstable. The whole sector. You know what? I, I don't <laughs> it touch. Doesn't make any sense. I, I don't touch ExxonMobil and BP, and I haven't for years because. You know, first of all, I just looked at the Exxon Mobil chart, which verified yeah. what I thought, but I wasn't sure. But in 2010, Exxon Mobil was around 80, and it's been gradually dropping. Then in 2020, it really dropped. Now it's at 68. So um, it's it, it, no, it's at 60 actually. I'm sorry, I just so I'm, I'm up. I'm up 37 percent on. Well, yeah, uh, it's it's up, and I'm up 23 percent on BP. So they're no, both no, no. In the best. last six months, it's up. But if you look Plus at the long-term trends. Yeah, but it's, it's down because it was really slammed, and then of course right. a lot everything's up a little bit. But but the yeah. thing is, I don't like the outlook for the oil and gas industry because oil, basically natural gas, I like. But oil, I think that there's so much danger of uh, pressure, and there, it's interesting too. By the way, I looked at some of these companies for a little while, like Total. But some of the companies like Total are saying, we are going to invest in solar. So they're taking all their money and investing in solar. And But other companies like Exxon are saying, no, no, we're going to keep, you know, stay with the right, oil right, business. Right. And that's why they put these activists on. But I'm not sure it's not, you know, swimming against, uh, you know, heading against tailwind, tailwinds or headwinds. Because you, in t I've heard that 30 percent of cars in the U.S. may be. EVs and EVs are spreading around the world. So with the EVs, they're all going to be, and then eventually you get driverless EVs too. So with, um, and there's other factors too, by the way, increased. So also CAFRA standards, you know, in other words, increased mileage from cars, you know, as, as they improve the 
EVs come out, all these other companies are under pressure and they have been getting more and more mileage out of cars. So if you look at the EIA projections, there's different scenarios. I looked at them this week because I was saying, should I own an Exxon or whatever? But some of the scenarios have oil use going down within 10 years. Other ones have flat, some of them go it up. But it easily could be if, if oil usage starts going down and also a lot of people retiring, maybe driving less, maybe the office market, you know, these changes in the office market. So all these factors are like, why would I want to own a oil company when I can own a natural gas company? For sure. Because the projections for natural gas are clear. Every And EVs are going to run on power plants, which are going to be powered by solar to a point, but it's going to take a lot of natural gas too. Mm -hmm. So it seems yeah. like that's the growth industry. So TRP, for instance, is 80% natural gas. That's a Canadian company that um, has a nice dividend and has been doing nicely, five and a half, six percent 6%. Um, the pipelines in USAC, provides the motors that push the natural gas um, and uh, MPLX has a good natural gas uh, interest but also the, they have some oil dependency too but it's less than a lot of the oil companies and also if they're making so much cash flow even at this dividend they could you know they could lose a third of their cash flow to tax changes or whatever and still cover their dividend mm -hmm. so I'm a little nervous about the energy companies and I keep looking for a good one, but you know, I don't know. Yeah, but but I, I, it was, uh, for me, at least in the short term so far, it's been a good sector. I've avoided the financial sector. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I guess partially because I work in it and partially. <laughs> <laughs> partially you know what's going on. <laughs> well, it, hey, Peter, it's every week. Every week I get a report from a Brad who works who, who work at the insurance companies and works with their executives and their portfolios and the um, the, the pressure that they're under to yeah. uh because of the low interest rate environment their limited investments and so they they're everything is down 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 and and then when i look at some of the other ones like if you're originating mortgages well everything's sold 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 i mean uh, the financial sector to me is really very challenging i don't see anybody that's going to be hey where's the big win here um yeah. in terms of the financial sector and also if, interest yeah. rates you know if interest rates I mean, my forecast is they're da down so low, they're going to pop back up. And right. by the way, if you want to see where they're going, you just look at a 40-year trend line, yeah. which has well, almost been it, straight for 40 it, straight it, years until yeah. a little hook down during the pandemic. So, but it's not going to go much higher. And once mm -hmm. it gets back on the trend line, it'll, it'll keep going down. But if it keeps going for eight more years, 10 more years, whatever, if you follow that 40-year trend line on the 10-year treasury, you get to zero. Financials right. are not going to do well at zero interest rates because banks are no, going to be having to yeah, loan yeah, at very low no, rates. There, they're not no going to, and the market will probably keep going up for a couple more years, yeah. and then it's going to flatten because everybody will be in there and take all the economic profits out of it. It's there, another there, MBA. Another thing uh, you learn in MBA well, school is whenever this quote economic profits, which is excess profits, people yeah. move in. Well, we're in the information age now, so people figure out, hey, there's economic profits in the stock market. I can get a better return than sure. zero rates. Than so zero. Yeah. so all you have, all you have to do eventually to what happens is all the yeah. economic profits get out. So now the stock market drifts higher, maybe at a very gradual rate. But what do the insurance companies do? What do the banks do? You know, and not to mention the commercial financial disaster that could happen with the black swan. So it's going to, I don't do financials at all, you know. Do, do, do you know, do you know uh, before I got on this phone call, I got, I had a phone call from our office in Salt Lake. Some of the executives who work with a major insurance company got laid off. That I've known for 20 years, seriously. And they were attorneys and stuff. I said, well, what happened? They hire, the management never fires people. You know what they do, Peter? They hire a management consultant that goes in and oh, says yeah. you should fire these people, right? That now, happened to I, me once. <laughs> okay, right. And you know, they're all in this case, they're all older people that have been around for a long time. So a couple of my friends that were in advanced underwriting are all now laid off uh, because the management consultant goes, Hey, you're gone. That was the phone call this morning. They laid off a bunch of people. Now, is why would they lay off? Yeah. Because, because they can't, because they're, they're so tight 
because the thing is they're trying to make interest rate spreads and there's no spread to make. Right. In other words, you, you, you can't and do what that. what if they keep going down for another couple of years? I, I, I don't it know. It gets tighter and tighter. Yeah. It's like we own, but you know what? Some of these companies may do well for, if they sold a lot of life insurance, they may do well because like people it's are living longer. So that, that helps to a point. But you know what? If you're getting 0.1%, or one half a percent on your return in, over a long term or one percent. And then you, um, so what, you stretch it out another 10 years, you still have to, you you originally sold that life insurance with an assumption of getting 10% in the market or some, yeah. you know, so well, yeah. It's there, there, there's, there's, there's very little spread on even yeah. a, a basic annuity contract because by the time they pay the producer, the, by the time they credit the client, by the time they take that money and they invest it, they and they have to invest in all these guaranteed. There's no spread for them, so they're they're yeah. stuck. So every time I look at financials, I go, I have nothing in it. I don't think I have anything in financials right now, and I don't anticipate to get. I don't like the sector. No, I don't you know what I mean, I go, I work in it, and do I have a lot of my own money in it? Yes, only through renewals once again. But they're diversified with a lot of insurance companies now, as opposed to everything in one insurance company, which is not a good idea, by the way. But I was first getting started. When you first get started, you can get baptized by fire. Okay, and and you know it's not like I had a, even an opportunity to get diversified uh, by then. But uh, financials is not a good sector. I do like the tech sector. Like oh, yeah. that's the reason I like FireEye because FireEye has possibilities over the next ten years to to do quite well because of the. Um, or if it's not them, it's another cybersecurity. Well, that's what I was about to ask you, Nick, because you know what? I had the same thought this last week or two. I asked my uh, brother-in-law, Michael, who works in security for a law firm, and you know, I said, who are the best companies? So he gave me two names. But when I looked at it, I was like, they're already pretty high, and I didn't see the numbers there. you know. And I said, how do I know who's going to win? Why fire I when there are lots of you know, is there something about the revenue growth or something about them that made them why fire eye when there's it's because they were actually around. mentioned by Joe Biden. Oh, as, uh, OK. In other words, he basically got a plug by the president. And, uh, you know, our, our that, most, could be, that could be a hint. <laughs> OK. Our most watched show on the IBM TV network is Cyber Talk with over oh. one million views. Wow. One million views. Why? Because think of the sector. This is what Rex Lee does. He talks about oh, cybersecurity. Cyber and cyber Sorry. issues. It just beams out zillions of people watch it. He goes like, it's incredible because because what happens is there aren't too many um, cyber talk shows on the um, major media right now. As a matter of fact, I can't even name one. Maybe you guys watch cyber security shows. Have you? No. Okay, no, I, I haven't either. Fun. Okay, so Rex does a cyber security show. <laughs> so he gets a big following and he distributes the Epic Times and all these other places and gets a million people watching it. I'm going, well, how do you do it? Well, I don't have a lot of competition right now. <laughs> no, he's right. Wow, and and the same with FireEye. There really aren't that many cybersecurity companies out there that are publicly traded. What you see is a lot of other companies like IBM that has a security ish area. My son works at SaaS Systems. They have a security area, but they don't have a company really devoted just to cybersecurity issues. But I just see that in the next 10 years to be a um, a, a problem with large companies, mid-sized companies. And small oh, yeah, companies. it's a huge problem. I mean, there's a big market and it's going to keep growing. It's, I just, yeah. well, that's true. You're in a I'm market. On the, you know, the market's a good market, you know. For I'm the, betting on the yeah. sector, dude. So actually, did you buy the stock or did you play puts and calls? <laughs> he always cover calls. I know. Yeah, I, I decided <laughs> slowly. See, this is not, this stock cannot be your core holding. It doesn't pay dividends. It's a very competitive right. industry. There is a right. crowd right. strike, which is a way bigger company and um, a much better competitor in this oh, particular okay. thing. However, uh, if Biden called that particular company, and with all other things being equal, maybe to have a small position. So what I did, I executed two things. Well, number one, uh, um, covered call. So I bought, bought a couple of thousand shares, sold covered calls against that. And uh, I also sold uh, puts, which are expiring on June 11th at uh, $22 uh, strike price. 
So this way I will acquire even more shares, but my price of the shares will be way, way below where they are trading now. So you sold 22 puts, you yeah. sold calls too? At what price? Of course. I bought some shares, a couple of thousand shares, and I sold 20 calls. Okay, so you, oh, I see. So you sold puts at 22, you sold 20 calls, and what was oh, the, um, what was the price on the calls you sold? Okay, hold on. Uh, okay, so my price for a stock was $22.16, and I sold calls at uh, 80 cents. So essentially, my price for the stock is only twenty-one dollars and thirty-six cents. But you also sold puts, right? It's a different transaction. Yes, I sold also puts, twenty-two and a half. Sorry, twenty-two and a half puts sold expiring June eleventh, and uh, I got paid uh, sixty-one cents. Okay, so you're really buying the stock much less expensive. You know, and your only danger is, of course, if it goes down a lot, then you're going to collapse up down to zero. And you wind up with even more share, but you don't down. mind because you like the stock. Yeah, I, I'll say that this is probably a momentum stock. I think it could go up to okay. probably twenty-five dollars, maybe more. But yeah. uh, but but I don't want to take a risk to buy stock at twenty-two and a half, and whether it will go to twenty-five or to twenty. Right. Most, most scenarios are possible. So even if it will go to 20, so with my price around 21 or so, okay, so it's much less painful and it's very easy to exit. It's quite liquid stock, so it's very easy to exit. So I figured out that now, when you compare my downside and upside, now the game is really stuck in my favor. And uh, therefore, I like yeah. the condition. Well, the, just to point out, but I'm not disagreeing. I mean, I'm going to look at the company this week and, you know, see what it says. I can never be a technical trader because I just, very, I like very nice. it, but, but I use technicals too. But, but I mean, your downside is if it were to drop, you could wind up with all those shares from the puts you sold too, right? And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. But, but you, mind, you like the company, so. I about this company, I can't really figure out whether I like it or not. I like the opportunity. Uh, to me, it's a trading opportunity. Yeah, I'm, my mentioning uh, it is interesting because it's like that means maybe the government, U.S. government is working with it a lot, you know. And, and well, that, that's why the stock maybe took in inside information. <laughs> it's like that's you, why I never that, put you never know. stock in my investment account, only in trading account, but I do options and uh, some riskier uh, strategies. So I, I can afford to do that. I have no problem with that. Because uh, if you compare my downside and my upside, I think the game is uh, favored. Uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he's right. It doesn't play dividends. So it's definitely not. A, it's definitely a momentum play. It's a momentum it's, stock. It's, it's a yeah. momentum stock. And it's when it first came public about six years ago, it, it pushed all the way to $80 a share. Oh, $80 yes. a share. Yeah. And then reality set in and it right. went straight down to like 20 and then all the way down to $10 a share, which wow. seems to be its resistance level. It hit around 10, then uptick to around 20 uh, about a year or so ago. And it's been sitting there ever since. But uh, this is where I'm looking at the momentum play like his. I'm going, well, it, let, let's go fast forward five years from now. There, there are going to be less or more cybersecurity issues. Is it going yeah. to dwindle? Yeah. I mean, come on. Oh, it's, this it's, it's issue be more. will be. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's there forever. It's exactly. going to be around for a long time. And now, now this is, of course, the issue that we won't know is how well are they going to do relative to other cybersecurity corporations? In other words, who's going to be the big winner? That part I couldn't bet on. Well, Pfizer was an easy bet. There, Pfizer, there, there are ETFs. There will be enough business for all of this. Security. Well, that's the other point, Sasha. There, may, there are enough business to go around, especially in the cybersecurity area, because you have today almost all systems are run somewhere on an internet with security issues. Absolutely. Small businesses, large businesses, medium-sized businesses, international businesses. Everything has a cybersecurity angle oh, yeah, to it. and there's huge issues more than ever with the, you know, yeah, well, well, and, 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 forces and, 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 you know. Well, they demonstrated yeah. that on Colonial Pipeline when they oh, were yeah. able to break through an intranet, not right. an internet, which means it's almost like this. Nobody's safe anymore, so you're going to need to have some company 
that's always watching your back when it comes to security issues. Right. So I, th I think the $10, let's say that's the worst case scenario. It drops to $10 a share. That really? Over the next five years, you're going to tell me that they just don't have any business because the cyber well, you know market, well that, yeah, the question is who the winners are. I mean, I don't know yeah. the other th way to do it, but you see, this makes me a little nervous too, is I've looked at this thing. Like, I've looked at it in automation too, like robo and things like that, you know, sure. where I think robots are coming fast, but right. if you look at this and, or if you look at a, a ETF or a mutual fund that has a lot of cybersecurity, the thing is, everybody's playing the same game. It's like we walked into the casino. It's not like it's a secret that cybersecurity is going to be big. And I'm not arguing against it, by the way, because, you know, they could be underestimating. But I'm just saying, how do you, it's hard to say, has the market already discounted, you know, the growth already? And, right. you know, I don't know, but I'm going to have to study it. And, and you know, I'll look at it again. Yeah. It's fire eye. Well, well, has everybody looked at it? Because remember, we, we have a new sector coming in. The cra I call them the crazies. The crazies, remember there's AMC, Tesla, oh, yeah. um, GameStop, uh, the individual crazies that uh, I look on the internet. Oops, I shouldn't say too much because we distribute GameStop. to these people. <laughs> we distribute to these people, so I shouldn't really talk too much about the crazies. But I've seen them before. In other words, like years ago when the market was up in the 90s, when they had all these dot-com booms, everybody was an expert, you know, during the Clinton administration. And then all of a sudden the market fell. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, yeah. all the courses to make you rich disappeared. I knew a lot of the speakers, they were out of business. All the people that were making you rich were out of business. All the people that are doing rich are out of business. The question is when that day of reckoning comes, right. who's going to still stick around and who's going to be gone? In other who's words, holding the bag? <laughs> what? who's holding the bag? Yeah, who's going to hold the bag when, when the only reason I don't think the circus is going to go away right now is with right. Uncle Joe in the White House. He goes, oh, we're having problems in the stock market. Let's print money and send it out. Well, and that's that always... why I don't think. But even you know what? What I was saying before about interest rates, if interest rates keep declining, then the market's got a nice run for the next few years at least. Because, oh, that's right. We're, you know we're in the roaring 20s. I might we're be like, I don't want to get half a percent in American Express, but I want to get 0.1% in American Express less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, like, and okay, okay, my Peter, water, Peter you know? we're, we're in the roaring 20s. So you make hay while the sun yeah. shines. But the only question is, when is the depression, exactly. the 30s going to hit? And how will people feel when the market does like it did in 2008, goes like a roller coaster? Boom. Yeah, I don't Straight think it will really. I think it's going to go up and then flatten out, and it'll be very slow growth in could a be. decade. And by, by the way, it could for be. the rest of our lives, I think this is like the last ride to grab something that yeah. you know to grab yield and things like that. Because if, if we're heading for zero rates, you know, then at some point, all the market will have adjusted to that. And once the, I talked about this last week, but I and you weren't there, Nick. But and there's not much time. But there were studies. That over a thousand years, and, and and I'll maybe repeat it next week because we only have a few minutes. But uh, they did a thousand year study in Barron's about 15 years ago. I read this. They looked at China's stock market, U.S. stock market, and uh, England's stock market, and so they got a thousand years, and they found that every time when the population under 50 is growing relative to over 50. The market went up and when the population over 50 is growing relative to under 50 it went down the correlation was almost 1.0 and for a thousand years so so now you say well wait a minute the last first like from 2000 to 2010 the market was flat and it was pretty you know not it was not doing well before that but from 2010 to 2020 it tripled but there's only one factor that's going against this thousand years of history Rates are going like, whoa, and that pumps up the market. But you can pump the market up, pump the market up when you hit zero. There's no more pumping left because you can go slightly negative, pay, but people won't really pay a lot to, of interest to hold your money because they can buy a safe. And um, so, so they can pump the market up for a few more years and we're on this juice. But it's just another reason why probably, unless they lose control of this mess, it's going to go to zero. But so the market will probably have a nice run for the next five years, four years, 10 years. But then at some point, it'll probably flatten out. And that's like the next 20 years. Yeah, yeah, you hope it flattens and doesn't dive. I don't think so, because you know what? At zero, <laughs> it might go up and down. But if, if rates stay at zero, which is what the governments are going to want it to do, 
then you still have no other place to put it. So you yeah. take a chance on a stock that's already tripled and hope that, or you take a half a percent dividend and say, wow, I'm getting half a percent and maybe some growth, you know, so it keeps the game going for a while. So, I mean, it may, it may go up and down, but in the I'm end, not I don't think it's going to I'm not expecting market to be very nice in next week or so. Oh, really? Why? Reason, no, because there is an upcoming Federal Reserve meeting. It will be about a week from now. And usually before these meetings, market is getting nervous. Uh, one of the reasons I think psychological, they want to scare decision makers not to raise interest rates. So they can show, well, things are not that great. The market is not doing that well. So maybe just keep interest low or so on. So that's, that's a game being played almost every month or every two months. And uh, I don't see why it will be different uh, this week. So, so I have, uh, as I said, my TZA protection device. And once market will go down, probably it will not go that much, maybe a couple, couple percentage points. I will sell then, and only then I will sell uh, covered calls on TZA to increase my it's it's what my thought about and finally about uh, where we started this wba walgreens i want to remind that uh, i think very few people are aware now but in december of 1919 there was a takeover bid for uh wba walgreens at 68 dollars a share and stock at that time was trading around uh slightly over 60, 61, 62. So um, with all improvements, what they've done lately, I really fail to see how not the situation will repeat because there is a plenty of money. Money, they're looking for something to invest, acquire, to do just anything with the money. There is much more money than targets available. That's why I still believe that uh, there will be another takeover bid on WB, and that's. Oh, interesting. I'll, I'll look at WBA again. I'm I have eight percent in cash, and I don't. You know, it's like I just can't find anything in the market anymore that has any dividends. You, well, you, you you always have your checking account called MPLX, Peter. Yes. <laughs> well, the problem with that is it's up to ten percent, over ten percent. I, I saw that. I saw that. I was going. And when you oh, go, really? and that's make you know, I'm hanging on to it. Even yeah. over ten percent, but normally you go that puts the pressure on me psychologically because I like that's a lot of my money, you know, and it's like I know, I, right? But I have enough. Yeah. That would be an interesting exercise if you figure out something. When MPLX was around uh, twenty six dollars a share, it was not long long ago, right? Uh, I started selling puts in order to acquire MPLX. I wanted to be exercised. And I sold uh, one time. I sold twenty-seven puts. I didn't. Get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then I sold twenty-eight dollars puts. Yeah, didn't I know that. Yeah. Now I'm. I sold twenty-nine dollars. Right. Maybe, just maybe, I will get it finally. But let's assume that I will not get it. Will expire worthless. But now I'm wondering, did I make more money by selling puts? You might have. Yeah, you or, might have. Yeah. Or I would make more money by just buying stock and collect dividends for these three months. I really don't know. I, I'm quite okay. curious about that. Yeah, well, you you have to do the analysis. That's you know. <laughs> but absolutely. the dividend was paid, so that was you know. It's I think it's two one quarter of whatever it is two seventy six. I think so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so yeah, you know, you can make more money getting into a stock, but of course the danger is what if it goes? You never get in, and and then it or if it really takes off on you, you know. I mean, I personally think MPLX is probably worth another 30 or 40 percent more yeah um, but it, and i don't think it's going to go take I, off you know down. what uh, i no, think it's possible to stock trading i've learned that from um old friend of mine although i haven't seen him for the last number of years uh, he used to be um a car dealer and uh, he, he he did very successfully. What what he did? He was buying cars on the auction, and he had five six guys who were driving with him because he was buying five six cars at the time. And while they were driving back, he was selling all these cars to uh, the same guys who went with him on the auction, uh, plus 
$250, something like profit. So for, for one trip, he would make, say, $1,250, maybe $1,500. Now, now, but the thing is this. So I asked him, why are you doing that? And uh, what makes uh, your friends to be so confident to buy cars from you? He said, the major point of this business is to buy think at the right price. If you bought it at the right, right. price, yeah. It's just a question of time and money, uh, time and uh, how much money you are going to make. It's just a question. Right. You are going to make hundred percent money. It will yeah. take you an uh, hour and a half, or two days, or two weeks. It doesn't matter. You'll make. Yeah. Money. You, you, you know, you know, when you, you say that, Sasha, one of my first estate planning clients. This goes back to like 1985. That came through the door. He's the first guy I met that had a million dollar income tax bill. Okay. And um, his name was David, and he had $16 million worth of real estate, uh, and he would need help on his taxes. You would, too, if you had a million-dollar income tax bill. Um, and so the thing is, I said, well, what do you do? I invest in real estate. And I said, well, how do you do it? And his dad was also one of my clients. He had about $5 million, uh, net worth. This guy was worth $16 million. He goes, well, there's a secret to real estate investing. He said, and I said, well, what is it, David? He goes, you always make money. When you buy the property, you never make money when you sell it, and you've always got to buy right. And that's how he said that's how I approached real estate. He goes, all my deals, I make all my money on the acquisition. And I think the same principle applies to stock. You make your money when you buy. You never make it when you sell. It's when you buy and you buy at the right price. Because, And that's the reason I stay away when I look at the stock. I think it's overpriced or at a run up. I'm not interested. <laughs> Even though it could run up further, you also have a right. lot of downside. I'm, I'm looking for the one that is, that's the reason I, I like, uh, I'm doing so well in the energy sector. I bought it when it was down yeah, you got it on the dip. Yeah, I right. bought it on the dip, baby. You know, thirty-seven percent later, it's good to go. And uh, it's the same with uh, what I'm looking at in the cybersecurity. I think it's on the dip right now, or at least that when it came out at eighty a share. Right. Yeah. FireEye was way up there. That, that was like too, way too in the future, dropping down to twenty. It, it could go up to eighty, but it's going to take quite a long time. Oh, yeah. But who knows? Because what happens? The crazies could get in and say, oh, cybersecurity. Yeah. Cyber security, it's like AMC and Tesla. It's got to go. It's got to go. And they throw all their. Do you see what happened to AMC? The crazies oh, yeah. got in, they bid it up again. A lot, of times, uh, they they go a lot of times they go after the short sales where there's a high percentage of short sales because they try to squeeze the shorts, create short squeezes. Right. That's what, you know, I don't know if that would happen. Yeah, I'm right from time to time. What I would like to mention finally about the WBA, we will not talk anymore today about it, is yeah, just have, in today's, yeah. today's action, the Dow Jones is about zero. It's just slightly up, maybe just yeah. uh, a, a, a touch. However, uh, Walgreens is up a percent and a half, one and a half percent. So relative, there is a very important concept in the market, relative strength. The relative strength of WBA is really good. Today's action on the market confirms it. Okay, guys, I'd like to thank you for uh, participation in a lovely discussion, and I'm looking forward to see you next week. It's a POT TV financial program. My name is Sasha Starr. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nick. Bye. -bye. Thank you.